Welcome. Thank you all for coming to Museum Midday. This is our second Museum Midday, and we're excited to have all of you here, uh, as well as Dorica Jackson. So thank you so much for coming. Dorica has been Chilcat weaving on and off for about 44 years, uh, having started when Chilcat weaving was an endangered art form. She's credited with being one of the first weavers to complete a contemporary Chilcat blanket and with other renowned weavers for rediscovering the specific method of weaving. And we are always honored when Dorica shares her knowledge with us <laughs> by instructing Native Art Studies program classes with the Totem Heritage Center. Uh, so Dorica, the format for Museum Midday, Dorica will take 20, 30 minutes roughly um, to speak about her work in this exhibit, as well as pieces that have influenced or inspired her. So thank you so okay, much for being you. here with us. Thank you. Thanks. Before I get started, I just wondered if anybody had some burning question that they'd like to ask me. Nobody? Not yet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's more yes. There's one question. Yes. How did you first get interested? Okay, that leads beautifully into this. I was attending uh, the University of Washington. I was an art major and into textile design and fell in love with weaving. My professor, uh, Richard Proctor, suggested I take some classes on Northwest Coast Indian Art to get a you know, more varied design exposure. And so I signed up for Bill Holmes' second quarter uh, series, which turned out to be not two-dimensional design, but the sculpture. 3D stuff. And I got really interested in Northwest Coast Indian Art, so I signed up for the next semester, which was, uh, or quarter, which was dance and drama, primarily focusing on Indians from the Vancouver Island um, area, but also touched on the northern tribes. And Chilcat Weaving came into the picture as the dancers were wearing these robes, and he mentioned that it was uh, a dying art form, that there was Jenny Clinot and Haynes, or Cluck Wan, and one weaver in Portland that he knew of that had just completed a, a huge rope for Don Maluska Smith. And so with all the arrogance of a 22-year-old, <laughs> I thought, oh, I'm going to learn Shilcat weaving. So that was how I got interested in it. And, um, I came up for the summer to Anchorage. My dad and stepmom had moved up there, and I volunteered in the museum working on their baskets. And uh, met Nathan Jackson, who was at an um, art show that was at the museum up there. And Bill Holm had talked about all these different artists when he was doing the class. And he would mention Nathan and some of these other carvers. Well, a lot of the carvers he talked about were in their 70s or 80s or gone already. So in my mind, Nathan Jackson was in that category. So he was at the museum, and I asked somebody which one was Nathan Jackson, and they said, that's him over there with the King Island dancers. And here's this young, handsome, dark hair, dressed totally in black guy. <laughs> That's Nathan Jackson. <laughs> and so I ran into them. I kind of uh, hung out with, uh, with him and his uh, girlfriend at the time and um, while well, he was up there and then ran into them again in Juneau. And then on my way down here on the ferry, uh, from Wrangell to Petersburg because I was making a, or Wrangell to Ketchikan because I was making a trip through Southeast Alaska to look at all the poles and everything. Um, Nathan was on the ferry and I told him I was going to learn Chilcat weaving and he said, uh, oh, you could make me a pair of leggings and I'll do some of my artwork for you. So I was supposed to get a frog dish and a bracelet <laughs> and a mask and I can't, I can never can remember the other thing that it was going to be. So uh, these leggings up here are what I did for my independent study, but he took me over to, uh, when we got to Ketchikan, he took me over to meet Selena Pradovich and she said, oh, you should come and take my basket weaving class that I'm teaching at the college at the end of September, early October. And I'm like, well, school starts then. I'll have to get permission from all my instructors. So I did that. I came up on the ferry. I did Selena's class for two weeks, which was great because Haida's weave down the warp. 
and Chilcat weaving. You weave down the warp. And so it was perfect introduction for the, the twining technique and all that for the Chilcat. So um, I went back home. I thought Steve Brown designed these, but it, I guess I did because he doesn't remember designing them. But he did my he painted my pattern board for me. He adds it and painted it. So these are baby ravens. That's Nathan's Tlingit name is Mithyedi, which means raven baby or young raven or raven child. And so I finished the first one. Um, came back up to Alaska again for the summer. I was done with college because I could see they weren't, I'd gotten, I think, five years in and they still hadn't come up with a degree in textile design because it was between the art department and the home ec department. They didn't seem to want to share anything. <laughs> the weaving had, was in the home ec department. So I was done with school. I came up, worked uh, at the museum that summer, and then came down to Ketchikan. And as things turned out, I got a better deal than just a mask. <laughs> <laughs> so we got married in 1974. And um, the following year, well, we were over in Sitka. Nathan was teaching a, a, doing a Bentwood box thing over there and he showed my, my leggings. One of them was done. The other one was partway done, maybe done by then. And we show, he showed them to Ellen Lang, who was the superintendent of the Park Service, and she commissioned me to do a chill cap blanket for the National Park Service in Sitka. So that was my, from 1975 to 1976. We lived in Sitka a whole year, and it really does take a year to do one if you work at it full time. Um, the techniques involved are twining and three-strand braiding, and then the side braids are, you can see that on these robes that are in here. Um, it's kind of a plating technique. And so anyway, these were done, and um, then, we, you know, I raised my family, had kids, uh, didn't weave too much, then Cheryl Samuel, and I actually were learning at the same time. So I kind of hung out with her group of weavers when we were both at University of Washington. It was fun to weave with other people. And then she went off and did all this research and wrote a book, and I'm so glad she did that, because I never would I never would have done that. And um, she came up and started, she was teaching a class, I think, here in, seven, in 82 or 83. And so we kind of had a big weaving party at my house. Nathan was out of town on some project. and. Um, she said, you know, I discovered why my three-strand braid doesn't look right. And I'm going, yeah, I was wondering because when I was doing mine at, and then I'd look at the old blankets at the Park Service, it wasn't looking the same, but I was following the directions in Emmons' book on the Chilcat blanket, which was really all I had to go from besides um, looking at old robes. and. The, all the hand spun yarn was S, was Z twist, and all the commercial yarn is S twist. And so when you do the original way of twining or braiding with a yarn that's a different twist, you're going to get a different effect. So I was one inch into a chill cap blanket that I was doing as a trade for some work on our house, and. Um, I took the whole thing out and started over because I could see the difference. So the next, my next piece was this Chilcat dance apron, which was a killer whale design that Nathan designed. And then um, I decided to do this bag for the wife. The, the apron was really for the guy, the husband. And I decided to do this little bag for the wife. And on the the front, it's a baby eagle design, and then on the back, I use the technique that they use on the tunics. And then I decided Nathan um, should have his own chill cap blanket. So that was my next project that I started in about 1995 and finished in 2001, because just life happens and other things get in the way, and I didn't have to make a living at it, so I wasn't into huge output, but when I would go somewhere, Nathan would be on a project and I'd go and demonstrate Chilcat weaving, I would always get a lot done because I'm just sitting there eight hours a day weaving. 
And so I finished that in 2001, and it was danced for the first time at the Peabody Museum at Harvard when they had the repatriation, um, the poll that Nathan did and Stephen worked on for uh, replacing the poll that was brought back here to Ketchikan, Saxman area. And so it was danced then for the first time, and it's been danced many times since. And then the next year, I started working on Warp for a project I'm still working on. So that was 2002. <laughs> and the blanket, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel now. I'm using the finest warp I, or weft yarn that I've ever used. I'll never go back to anything heavier because I like the finer the weft, the easier it is to get the shapes. And same with the warp, although the, you don't want the warp too fine. And they've gotten beautiful shapes with warp that's thicker than mine. So I think it's in the weft yarn. But anyway, um, and when I'm thinking, so now I'm thinking about my next piece. And when I saw Evelyn Shawl come in, which is over there, if you want to turn around, it's you see the back of it with the canoe on it. Um, I thought, oh, I know what I'm going to do next. Something for myself. <laughs> and I have it all planned out. It's something I will be able to wear, and, uh, and it'll have sleeves. I've always wanted to do a tunic with the sleeves. So um, yeah, I'm really excited, looking forward to doing that. And that's going to take some figuring out and some fitting and everything, but I'm excited to do that. So that is that piece is giving me inspiration for my next one. And um, so are there any questions now? <laughs> Will this be the first time you've done a textile slash garment for yourself? Yes. Oh, not no, not textiles. When I was in um, at the University of Washington, um, I did a lot of things for myself. I did block print stuff for myself. I did a batik skirt for myself. They're all very short because that was the <laughs> style back then. And um, I did a macrame dress for somebody else that had to have, of course, it had a, a slip to go with it. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so, and I've done rugs and things like that. I tend to want to go with the practical side when I weave instead of doing more arts, what you would call art stuff, mm -hmm. tapestries and that kind of thing. I, I want to do things that would be used. I do have an eight harness floor loom, which I'm actually looking forward to doing some work on too after I finish with this robe I'm working on now. So, yes, Holly? Uh, yeah, uh, in the beginning of your lecture, you uh, called it contemporary chill cat. What, why? Oh, no, that Marnie, Marnie, Marnie used that word. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm not even sure of the context now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because so, I just uh, thought, was wondering why. Well, we this did. would be more contemporary. Yeah. yeah. So my next piece will be more contemporary, but it will still be functionally used. Yeah. Because um, my question is, with the commercial dyes, that's not oh. why the term would be used, because it's not being uh, washed and thigh spun, well you thigh spun yours. For the, for the wet, for the work, for, for yes, the work. for the work. But for the material that is being I buy my left, yeah. So even though the material is being commercial purchased, it's not being distorted, you know, um, to contemporary, to traditional. You're still doing a traditional um, standard art right, piece. Right, right with additional pieces that are made right. commercially. I'm using commercial yarn. Sometimes I buy them pre-dyed, like with Nathan's blanket, they were all, they came all dyed, the colors I wanted. The one I'm working on now, I dyed them all myself. Never do that again. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Um, but yeah, I, I like to buy my weft yarn. I will spin my own warp, though. So. So there is a place you can buy it, but I like to spin my own because I can put more bark in it. Yes? I'm just wondering if you use primarily wool yarn or if mountain goat hair is ever used anymore? It's, or what is your main? Yeah, it's medium? not legal to get goat when the hair is the length you would want it to oh. be for spinning it. The end of goat hunting season is December, 
and that's when they're really starting to build up their long wool. So you can pick it off the bushes, but you'd need an awful lot. Most people use merino. I have some llama wool, which actually I'd like to use because it's long, it's long fibered, but also it's got the guard hairs in it. That you pick most of them out, but even in a chill cap blanket warp, you'll see, you know, some of the guard hairs in there. So does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Did Nathan make your bracelet? Yes. Oh. Nathan did make my bracelet. That was actually the first thing he did. The next thing he did after the frog dish. And we were at the Blueberry Festival one year when Stephen was a baby, and it disappeared. And we think we've seen a picture of it somewhere at one point, but we have no idea where it is. But it's got my name in it. <laughs> so somebody knows it's not theirs. Maybe it'll come back. Nathan's been having pieces of stuff he did early on come back. In fact, these two little guys right here were gifts to somebody, and they have come back home. So, yes? Yeah, you mentioned baskets. Yes. Um, do you teach weaving? Um, Holly teaches basketry. Diane Willard teaches basketry. I don't teach basketry. I'm not good enough. <laughs> not for baskets. She weaves yes. baskets. I, um, I do have some I did in Selena's class that I, I still have. That was fun, but I'm, I'm more into the... So where are the classes? They're at the Totem Heritage Center, oh. and they have a new cycle of classes every year. I think most classes are filled up for this year, but there is a waiting list. So, any other questions? Yes? Does Nathan have a brother? <laughs> <laughs> are all taken. <laughs> He's one of a kind. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Are you able you took to my classes, yeah. Are you able to teach left handers? The first person I taught was a left-hander. Do you teach them left-handed? Well, to weave left-handed. If you're really? using both hands when you weave, so I'm not. Okay, that's just exactly you come in, what you I was come and talk to was, me. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought you would say. Yeah, because a lot of right-hand peepers cannot teach left-handers, and I, uh, Cheryl Samuels found this out. Because I am strictly left-handed when I do pick up my weaving, mm -hmm. and I was having the toughest time trying to, like you said, make your corners, and mm -hmm. also when I go one way and come back, I notice that it, there was a difference. And why is there a difference? There shouldn't be. There's a difference with the way the yarns cross over each other, but the slant of the the slant of the twining should still be the same on each row. So if you're doing your if you're doing the yarns, like if the one from I don't know, it's hard to explain without yeah. pictures. <laughs> but you you want your yarns will not the the one crossing over the top or underneath is going to be different depending on what direction you go. And it doesn't matter if you're right or left handed. Once you I, I understand that and once you do get started, but like when I was beginning, beginning, and I was forced to go from right to left. Yeah. And I can't. I it's had it. the toughest time trying to do that, but it seemed like once I learned how to do the left to the right, I was fine. But it, until I got that movement going mm -hmm. and stuff, that it was okay. And one day, uh, one year, Cheryl, came back and I told her, I said, I'm happy to do this. But you're using both hands. I yeah. said, yes, I am. But I said, it doesn't feel right to me. And she went home and she discovered, she said, you're right, Lorraine. There is a way for left-handers to begin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I don't know. I just know the first person I ever taught was left-handed. So I didn't. I, I haven't picked up my weaving in a while. So if you're starting now, you're weaving over. Now I'm get, I, I might confuse myself. If she could said something about going under right. instead of going right. over and right. you go back the opposite yeah, way. Yeah, it's going to be different going back the opposite way. Yeah. yeah. Whether you're right-handed or left-handed. <laughs> <coughs> yes? This may sound odd, but is there anything that you're supposed to do at the end of a piece? Um, like the special finish or? Yeah, on the robes, they have, um, they do the borders and then they do a little bit of white underneath. The last row would be a two strand instead of a three because on the robes they put an overlay fringe over the top. On small pieces like this one, I just finished it. I was out of work. Um, this one I did warp wrapping, so that's something else you can do. Um, Evelyn's just got, I think, a finish row on the end of hers as do the others. So it depends on the piece and the function of the piece. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yes. Oh, it's a kind of a two-part question. I know you said um, that part of your motivation for ever um, learning chill cat weaving was Bill Holm telling you about it being such an endangered art form. But beyond that, why chill cat weaving? What is what is the unique draw of that particular medium? What what is special about chill cat weaving? Oh, probably because I had become interested in Northwest Coast Indian art, and I love to weave. I love the complexity of it. It's a challenge. Every time you do a new piece, you're learning something new because of the way the design elements fit together. And um, I don't know, it's just, any kind of weaving for me is really therapeutic almost. I mean, I really enjoy doing it, but um, I just, I really love the way Chill Cat goes together. What's different about Chill Cat though than other weaving art forms? Well, it's twining actually. Um, I don't know, it's all a twining technique on a free hanging warp. You don't have a, you have a very simple loom. I mean, anybody can, you don't have to buy this eight harness thing that takes up all this space in your house. But um, I don't know, the color, I love the colors, you know, especially as they, they age a little bit and they get a little bit more muted. I think I like that. Um, but I like other kinds of weaving too. It's just the, you know, working on this project for, what, 14, 15, 16 years, uh, off and on. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, and I'm married to a pretty good chill cat guy. <laughs> chill cat guy. <laughs> Did somebody over here have a question? No? Derek, I was gonna ask you, you mentioned the eight harness Yes, mm -hmm. yes. A couple of times? Yes. What does that allow you to do that? Um, you can make coverlets, you can do linens with designs in them. Um, you can do twills. You can do all kinds of really fancy designs okay. that are woven in. It's, you know, it's, and it's all very mathematical, which I think I love about weaving, is the math involved, because okay. that's the way my brain works. Right. Don't ask me to make up the design, but once I have the design, I love the math of putting it together. And it's the same with Chill Cat, too. It's just like there's a lot of counting and math that goes into getting, making sure everything's symmetrical. So, but I love the eight harness loom, and man, if you've got frustrations <laughs> beating that Peter, <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> Actually, the, um, the client that I had wanted an old design, so I picked three designs out of Emmons' book on the chill cap blanket that I would be willing to weave mm -hmm. and sent them to 
the client and they selected one. And that's how I ended Were up. Happy with the one they selected? Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh -huh, yeah. I mean, I, I would have been happy with any of them because I only picked the ones that I would want to leave. I mean, there are some I would never want to leave. There's uh, one, Bill Holm was up here doing a class on pattern boards, and he had the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there's some really ugly ones. <laughs> what makes it ugly to you? Um, floating objects, too many floating objects. Like Nathan's robe, um, there are two sockeye salmon that are on a white background, but the rest is more like what you see behind you on the wall there, the uh, distributed design. But all the all kinds of pieces floating around on a white background just doesn't do it for me. <laughs> Not enough math. Not well. There's plenty of math, but um, I just don't. They're not aesthetically appealing to me personally. Yes. What's the best storage um, methods for the blankets? If you're not going to lay them flat in a big drawer, rolling them is best. And then dry, right? Oh yeah, you want them to I mean, be dry. Oh, not up, not to be stored really outside. Oh no no no, you want them in inside Central. storage, yeah, yeah. Anything else? Okay. No last question. Well, thank you all so much for coming. A great big thank you to Doug. <laughs>